Um, my name is Yvonne. I am a fourth year U.S. History PhD candidate at Columbia University. I have been doing research here in the Bay Area since last summer. Um, so my base is now here and I have a visiting pre-doc of sorts here at the Latinx Research Center. Um, it's a visiting dissertation research um, fellow position. Um, so I'm here frequently if anybody wants to talk to me at any point after this. Um, Usually I'm here if I'm not doing research in the archive or doing um, oral history interviews. Um, so I also want to thank everybody for coming to listening to us talk about research in progress and to the Latinx Research Center in particular for affording me both the space and access to the communities with whom I've had the opportunity to workshop some of these ideas. Um, the presentation that I'm going to be giving today is sort of an overview of the narrative that I plan to tell in my dissertation. Uh, with that said, I want to make clear two disclaimers. One is that I'm still in the research phase. Um, I reached candidacy last summer, right before I left to come here and do research. So while I'm more than happy to answer questions at the end of this, I myself have a lot of unanswered questions that um, I hope I will find more insights about in the couple of research trips that I have coming up at the end of the semester. Um, so the talk is called The Legal Origins of the U.S. Agricultural Child Labor Force because essentially it tells a story about the flaws and the practices over the 20th century that made it possible for a relatively invisible workforce to continue to exist to this day. Uh, today, farm work is actually considered the most hazardous industry for young workers, and yet the U.S. employs about 200 to 500,000 agricultural child laborers a year. Um, as you can see from the chart on the screen, agriculture is the deadliest occupation for children, resulting in the most child deaths than any other industry that employs youth labor. A vast majority of the country's agricultural child laborers live in extreme poverty, they are of Latinx descent, and they belong to families of mixed immigration, uh, mixed immigration statuses. This child labor exists in spite of a federal child labor ban that was implemented during the New Deal period, and it was part of a law called the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938. The law created and was prominent and known for being um, what created the national minimum wage and maximum hours protections, and they continue to be our standards for those protections today. But like many other New Deal reforms, the Fair Labor Standards Act excluded agriculture from its provisions, and it marginalized many of the country's black and Latinx farm workers who throughout the 20th century constituted um, overwhelmingly the demographic of farm workers and migratory farm workers in particular. Um, the nation's first federal child labor ban was included as part of this law, the Fair Labor Standards Act, after decades of advocacy of publicity campaigns and failed attempts at national legislative reforms. The movement was led largely by organizations like the National Child Labor Committee, the National Consumers League. They helped to outlaw oppressive child labor in interstate commerce for the first time nationwide. And you can see the original language of the 1938 ban um, on the screen, which is largely the oppressive child labor provisions banned in interstate commerce. Outlawing oppressive child labor in the law reflected the belief that young children didn't belong in dangerous sites of employment because workplace was considered the exclusive domain of adults. The definition of oppressive child labor identified the site that was supposed to most appropriately facilitate the development of a child's well-being, and that was the school and not the workplace. That was sort of influenced by these rising ideas of what a modern childhood was supposed to be. Um, and that modern childhood allowed youth to be sheltered from the dangers of streets and workplaces which were only um, supposed to be for right for adults, um, but they became this right, um, these rights became important to legal and social citizenship and they were institutionalized in large part by the National Child Labor Ban. But the ban included a number of exemptions, the most notable of which, again, lied in agricultural occupations, and they would marginalize the country's increasingly Mexican and black agricultural child laborers. The National Child Labor Ban didn't include minimum age or maximum hours protections for work that happened outside of school hours. You can read the um, exemption, the agricultural exemption to the ban on the screen, the provisions of section 12, Related to child labor shall not apply with respect to any employee that's employed in agriculture while not legally required to attend school. And because school attendance was a local prerogative, enforcement of compulsory educational laws relied on state law and regulations, so coverage varied from state to state anyways. 
Among those who performed agricultural labor after 1938, after this law was implemented, were millions of extremely mobile farm working families. They followed the major migratory routes that you can see on the screen. Um, the three most significant migratory streams in the country originated in the following three states, California, Texas, and Florida. Um, this is actually a document from the archive. I probably also should have mentioned that in the beginning. I have a lot of pictures from the archive, um, so some of them might not be as visible, but I think it's important to show that like a lot of this evidence comes from the original sources that you can actually find here at the Bancroft and various other archives in the country. Um, the largest of these uh, routes was the one that came out of Texas, out of the Rio Grande Valley, and it traveled predominantly to fields in the north. These two western migratory streams, the ones from California and Texas, they were represented overwhelmingly by Mexican families who followed the crops by the beginning of the post-war period. And my research focuses on the Mexican children primarily who followed these crops with their parents or without them sometimes, because by the 1940s, migrant laborers of Latin American descent made up a majority of the nation's domestically migratory workforce. African Americans in the migratory route that started in Florida, the eastern seaboard one, also contributed important labor to the country's own workforce, but they, one, exhibited lower levels of family migration in particular than those of Mexican descent, and two, they would eventually leave the stream in the late 20th century. The Texas route actually would, you don't see it on this one because it was published in the 1940s, but after the 1940s, it had a stream that actually went into Florida, so that's what started to create part of the influx of Latinx farm workers that started traveling the Florida route. Um, and today there are so um, many um, people of Latin, of Latin American descent that now work that eastern route, and actually goes all the way up to Maine now. Um, even though it was extremely difficult to quantify the demographics of the children in this group, precisely because of their transients, there is fragmentary evidence in the archive that suggests that in the post-war period, the majority of the country's migrant children were mostly of Mexican descent. And by the later 20th century, there would be little doubt that most of these migrant child laborers were descendants from Latin America, largely from Mexico and Central America, and were Spanish speaking. Migrant youth who followed the crops with and without their families were considered the most educationally deprived group in the nation whose childhoods were systematically denied. Because these children followed the nation's crop schedules with their families, their work season often began a month or more before the school term ended and finished after the school term had begun. They struggled to complete even a single grade level and they started working alongside their parents as young as six or seven years old and they would drop out before they turned 14. By 1960, the Department of Education reported that migrant children had the lowest educational attainment of any group in the nation, and they were deemed the nation's largest single reservoir of illiteracy. Now, before moving on, I think I should um, make a point of clarification about the terminology that I'm using to describe the farm workers. I, sort of, I replicate what the historical actors themselves called um, these groups of people and what they themselves called, what they called themselves. Um, but the migrants who publicly dominated the attention of lawmakers, of journalists, and government researchers in the early and mid 20th century were these poor and transient U.S. residents who migrated domestically from community to community and across state borders in search of better economic opportunity. Indeed, many were U.S. citizens and not necessarily the international migrants that we refer to now. In 1937, just one year before the Fair Labor, the Fair Labor Standards Act was passed, the Department of Labor published a report about domestic labor migration in an effort to better understand the causes of this kind of migration and its consequences. The report, the front page of which is pictured on the left, um, characterized the plight of the early and mid-20th century migrants by describing their lack of health care access due to legal status, poverty-stricken living conditions, discrimination, the threat of border controls, and limited education opportunity for kids. So a lot of these domestic migrants actually suffered from some of the same legal disabilities as today's undocumented population. But even though a majority of the nation's migrant farm workers um, were U.S. citizens, not everyone in the workforce was born in the U.S. In fact, there were various reports that described the hundreds of thousands of Mexican illegal aliens who constituted some of these routes. Um, but including people of various legal statuses under the term migrant posed a methodological problem. There was um, other research reports that discussed this problem, one of them being on the right, um, and it essentially said that it, 
the researcher had difficulties figuring out who the migratory workers were because they included both domestic and internal migrants, but also international migrants. So this was a group of sort of mixed statuses. Uh, migrants could have referred to those who had been in the U.S. Southwest for generations or the more recent Mexican illegal alien, as they were very frequently called at the time. Uh, the consolidation of these identity markers had more than just this kind of like rhetorical effect though. It essentially blurred the distinctions that existed between the citizen and the non-citizen and it made U.S. persons who work on farms, including children, migrant in ways very similar to their undocumented counterparts. Um, and in fact, if we return to the exemptions just briefly, um, it actually sta it stated um, that these provisions don't apply to kids who are employed in agriculture while not legally required to attend school, and that was a really key phrase, um, because often uh, compulsory school attendance laws didn't even apply to migrant children anyways, they only applied to permanent resident kids in the area. Um, and this language of the child labor ban made it possible for growers to continue to employ migrant children in the fields. In 1949, there was a very small change to the language that tried to bring migrant children under the protection of the child labor ban. Um, and it was largely advocated for by a slew of organizations. There's obviously not enough time to go over the work of all of them, but I put up a hodgepodge of a bunch of them. Um, some of them you might recognize, the National Child Labor Committee, LULAC, for example, actually litigated some educational equity cases that involved communities where migrant farm working children were being denied educational access. Um, there were groups dedicated to like figuring out best educational practices for these kids. Um, the UFW actually, um, this is where, this is like one of the research trips that I'm missing, but I've seen glimmers of this. Um, actually, it says our Chavez's birthday was yesterday, right? And um, he was, he himself was a migrant agricultural child laborer. He worked the California route at the age of 12, but even before then, he worked on farms beginning at age eight, I believe. Um, and the UFW would actually eventually start including anti-child labor uh, demands as part of its agenda. Um, and they would sort of like interpret um, minimum wage demands as anti-child labor reforms in really unique ways that has not yet been covered, to me it seems, by historical scholarship. So this, what's on the screen, is essentially to show that even after the amendments in 1949, um, there were still child labor violations all around the country, and the worst offenders were California and Texas. Um, so the work of these organizations achieved mixed results, um, and I, I want to be able to show that there were real kids who were um, working in the field, and in particular, undocumented children. Um, there were growers in, sorry, the, there's a report, um, one of the few that I could find in the archive that actually includes um, pictures of undocumented children who were working on farms. It's very small to see, but the, the right hand, the most right hand picture, um, it actually shows a group of children who are on their way to work to fields. Um, and then the group of interviewers also interviewed and photographed very young children, largely teenagers and an 11 year old who migrated frequently to Texas to work on farms. Um, ultimately, there was like a lot of collaboration between growers and Western home bases and migratory streams to work with school administration officials to make sure that they could circumvent the law. Um, other times, growers would just become lawmakers or members of school administration boards themselves so that they could directly have a hand in uh, directing policy and educational practice to make sure that they could continue to employ children legally. Um, their other reports at the time would make clear that um, the children who were working, both the adults and the children who were working on farms at the time, were of mixed immigration statuses, um, including that other report that I showed, which was unfortunately called What Price Wetbacks? Um, and this one in particular, which was published in 1940, made clear that there weren't any careful distinctions that were made between the illegal aliens and the citizens of Mexican descent, that they were all sort of lumped together, um, whether or not they were wetback or citizen, they were something to be needed and ignored as much as possible whenever they weren't needed. Um, Mexican farm workers in the U.S., no matter their citizenship status or age, suffered from the consequences of the racialization of the wetback. Because foreignness was a racialized concept and it adhered to all Mexicans, it didn't matter that many of the Mexican-American children who worked on farms were U.S. citizens. They suffered from many of the same legal disabilities that I've noted, whether they were um, lack of labor protections or limited access to the welfare state. Um, 
So irrespective of citizenship status, these young people who weren't afforded the rights of the modern childhood, which were supposedly institutionalized in part by the National Child Labor Ban. Um, there are various other reports that sort of alluded to this process of making, uh, of making migrants, and the, this very famous report by President Truman's commission did just that. Uh, the denial of the rights of childhood, in my view, become a tool for the oppression of immigrant families, and as a consequence, they become unrecognized mechanisms of 20th century immigration exclusion. If we conceive of immigration exclusion really broadly, so deportation isn't its only mechanism, and we see how it happens inside the nation. And the denial of the rights of childhood, they become these legal disabilities, and their consequences are those rights of, of, child, of both childhood and citizenship. In 1965, the Migrant Education Program was created as part of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, and it was largely as a result of a lot of advocacy from teachers and labor leaders. Advocates noticed that one of the main reasons migrant children couldn't advance in their study was because there weren't these special education programs that existed for them, and every time they tried to uh, enroll in a new school district, the, they, their access to education was often frustrated because teachers would claim that they didn't have transfer records, so that was one of the most um, important things that was implemented by the Migrant Education Program, this really um, sophisticated but sort of uh, growing in quality um, academic transfer system for these kids. Um, essentially, it was conceived as an anti-child labor reform because grow, uh, teachers and advocates figured if they couldn't get the labor law passed, they could get educational reforms passed that would keep kids in school as opposed to in the fields. And this program continues to exist today. It serves anywhere between 500 to 700,000 kids um, around the country every year. It's one of the main reasons that kids, these kids don't drop out anymore in the fourth grade, but evaluations of the program suggest that there's a lot of room for improvement. There's still kids who don't graduate from high school or they lag behind their peers academically, and hundreds of thousands of kids end up working in the field in spite of some of these educational programs. Um, most of these kids are served in those very same states that have historically been the origin points for the migratory routes, um, but today, with like the way that immigration ways have changed to this country, um, a lot of them have increasingly now, in the later 20th century and contemporaneously, been Central American, uh, <coughs> Central American immigrants. Um, this is a really quick review of some of the amendments, the only amendments that were made to the agricultural provisions of the child labor ban. I talked about the 1949 one, 1966 um, is. It has to do with the parental exemption, but it has to do with kids who worked on farms their parents owned, which are not the subject of my deportation, of my um, dissertation, because the ones that are my subjects are the ones who worked on commercial farms where their parents were not the owners of the farms. 1974 was the first time that the law clarified like the conditions under which very young children under 16 could work, and 1977 um, actually included new waivers making it possible for 10 and 11 year olds to work short crop, short crop schedules. Um, eventually those, uh, the 1977 ones and the other ones actually, they get litigated in the rest of the 20th century. Um, and this is just an overview of some of the organizations and people who are litigating some of these issues on behalf of these kids um, or raising awareness. The ILO is a UN agency. Mexico actually in the late 90s tried to litigate on behalf of Mexican citizens of the US, including child labor violations um, of Mex uh, migrant Mexican children. Uh, the Human Rights Watch has put out a bunch of reports about these kids. Uh, members of Congress have tried to issue letters to the president to try to change these laws. And there have been a number of documentaries, both about domestically migrant kids and also undocumented kids who get labor trafficked on farms. Um, so ultimately, I'm trying to tell a story both about how immigration exclusion happens inside the country, the way that it targets child welfare, and the historic origins of this workforce that continues to exist um, and defy the logic that history is a story of progress when that isn't always the case. Sometimes there are certain laws or certain rights deprivations that continue to this day. So, thank you. Studies at the University of Wyoming, 
and I'm also a visiting researcher here at the Latinx uh, Research Center. Um, I just returned yesterday from, uh, literally yesterday, I got home at, I think, 5, 5.30 from being abroad in Germany and the Netherlands for a week, so if I'm a bit off, my apologies, because I'm incredibly chill Um I think Yvonne was also traveling as well, so I assume, you know, it was a little like, um, exhausted. Um, thank you to Lola Perez, to uh, An uh, Angela, to Juan Berumen, and it's nice to share the space with you, um, Yvonne. Um, so the talk, uh, the title of the talk, it's also uh, the work, the research that I've been uh, working on while he, while being here at the at the center. So the title of this talk is Carolina Bale, a dowry, a winery, and a forgotten history. So I think there's some overlaps in terms of um, the way that we look at gaps in, in history. So this project or this talk is part of a new research project that's tentatively titled. Um, Napa Valley and Cork, Mexicans in the Wine Country, uh, and it is a historical ethnographic, um, a historical and ethnographic accounts uh, that highlights the methodological and epistemological erasures of Mexicans in Napa, California. Um, it is one of the first extensive historical and ethnographic studies of Mexicans in the Valley. So the main objective is to trace uh, the historical silencing of the Mexican narrative, of the Mexican narrative, and its rippling effect in today's, uh, in present-day Napa. So let me just tell you a little bit about that, this, this research and then I'll, I'll move into Carolina eventually. So I examine multiple mo moments and movements in Napa's historiography to rescue and situate the Mexican presence as key in the making of the wine country. Um, I begin in the 1960s with one of the first calls from four tractoristas, uh, Mexican immigrant tractor drivers, uh, to demand dignity and recognition in the making uh, of Napa via workers' rights. The Tractorista worked for the then Christian Brothers Winery uh, and organized to, the, to demand higher wages and the right to unionize. Those Tractoristas sought the support from Dolores Huerta, uh, Cesar Chavez, and the United Farm Workers, brought them to the valley, and won the right to unionize in the 1960s. So soon after, other wineries followed. The second moment that I examine uh, uh, is uh, in the 1940s, and, and I look at the Bracero program um, um, where uh, wineries, including Christian Brothers and the Charles Cruz Winery, among them, um, requested the, bra the Brazos to labor in the fields. So it was these Braceros, uh, Bracero workers who organized the workers' union uh, in the 1960s. Um, however, Mexicans in the Valley have been present since the California era, and this is the third moment that I examine. So I don't look at these moments uh, linearly, I, I jump around. Uh, so the third moment is the California era, uh, and in that era I begin with Carolina Bale, which I'll talk about uh, her today. Um, and she's a daughter of Californiana Maria Ignacia Soberanes and English doctor Edward Turner Bale. Um, Bale's marriage to Charles Krug led to the construction of a Charles Krug cellar, which is now the Charles Krug winery, uh, on land that came with her dowry. Um, as I'll talk later on today, historical records glance over the fact that Krug holds a present, uh, place in history because of his wife's land. And Carolina Bale's presence, on the other hand, has remained elusive. The ethnographic components of the project come in the latter moment when I focus on Mexican-American wineries, the rise of the professional Latinx middle class, and the growth of community organizations. Um, so, um, so this research uh, um, is in the early stages of one of the moments, which is Carolina Bale, and I'm still trying to figure out the actual map of, of, that, of that chapter. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll begin with uh, giving you some, uh, a, a little bit of context and I, I think sometimes we tend to give too much context and give you that much, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to skip some of the context. Um, in the spring of 2005, uh, I walked into the Napa County Historical Society located on 1st Street uh, in downtown Napa, and that's a picture of the Napa County Historical Society. Uh, I walked in with the goal of um, researching archives as I was on a hunt for any books, documents, family papers on the early Mexican presence in Napa. A self-described local historian, an older man, a white male in the 70s, told me that Mexicans did not arrive into the valley until after the 1950s. Therefore, I was wasting my time researching archives prior to then. Certainly, the self-described historian uh, was unaware that Mexicans had been living in the valley long before Napa was Napa, uh, and that migration from south to the north has been continuous. I thought about, you know, it's sort of like sometimes there's barflies. <laughs> Um, I thought about, well, maybe the Napa County Historical Society also has uh, the equivalent of barflies as well. Mm -hmm. um, so sir, um, he was also uh, unaware uh, that Napa, as historian Lin Linda Heidenreich tells us in her two 2007 study of the Mexican period in Napa, uh, that this land was Mexican once, and we should add or state that it was and is indigenous land. So this self-described historian relied on a particular narrative of the Napa Valley that continues to be recycled 
in most travel narratives and boosterist accounts that have assisted in, in constructing Napa's historiography. I should add that the only critical and historical account about the Napa Valley that I'm aware of is Linda Heidenreich's study, which was published in 2007. Although a book titled Hidden Histories of the Napa Valley, and it's not an academic text, uh, was recently uh, published by History Press and written by Alexandria Brown. And that book was just released on March 4th. I've been out of the country for the past couple of weeks, so I haven't been able to take a look at the book. Um, so what is this recycled narrative that the self-described historian relied on to assure me that Mexicans arrived in Napa in the 1950s? What were the silences that he produced within his statement and the simultaneous roots that he reinscribed as central to the Napa Valley? So the purpose of this talk is to trace the presence of Carolina Bale and situate her within the Napa Valley narrative as being uh, a key character central to Napa's wine industry. This moment is part of the uh, late 19th century California where I examined the lingering consequences of California Mexican Napa, the numerous identities that point to the legacy of conquest, the interracial marriage of memory, and how such are negotiated. So I examine how narratives that aim to establish a particular old, old, old world European identity as the, roots, as the roots of the valley continue to be cemented. So here I reread and question gaps within the archives and I critically engage in Napa's historiography where its diverse and complex cultural roots become a footnote at best or completely ignored at worst. In the process, I examine a story within a story that, as Michel Wolf Trio tells us, is always present within historical accounts. In my read, I present my methodological and epistemological approach, including historical and archival, uh, that allow me to trace uh, in other narrative, uh, in this case, Carolina Bales, that has been silenced and erased. So that approach is very much grounded within the Mexican and the Latinx community uh, in Napa. So let me, I think you all know Napa, so let me just tell you, I'll, I'll skip some stuff maybe. Um, Napa's in California, as you know, uh, and Napa has become synonymous with wine, and particularly with internationally recognized California wine. Um, there was a public television program that detailed Napa style by Michael Chiarello, who in 2016 was accused of drug, uh, of a sexual uh, harassment case and drug charges. Um, everything was eventually uh, dropped. Um, so he rebranded his his uh, label, and now he has a um, uh, as Italy Italy style. There is also Napa cooking, including tableware, drinkware, silverware um, that you can find at the Oxbow Market, um, including um, all these uh, Napa goods uh, are usually uh, grape shaped accoutrements that includes uh, cloths cork openers, uh, anything that, uh, um, <laughs> that includes grapes. Um, Napa is a, is a major tourist destination. Um, it is uh, believed to be the second most visited in, in uh, the second most visited place in California with uh, approximately uh, five to six million visitors per year. Um, so what, what uh, makes you know, Napa Valley uh, incredibly uh, interesting is that, or what made Napa Valley be the Napa Valley that is today, uh, didn't happen until uh, 1976. So um, in, in 1976, there was a blind wine tasting contest, contest in, in Paris. Uh, a British wine expert, Steven Spurrier, sponsored a blind wine tasting contest, uh, contest called the Paris Wine Tasting of 1976. Uh, and during that year, Napa Valley's 1973 Stag Sleep wine cellars, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, won the, red, the best red wine, while Chateau Montelena's 1973 Chardonnay won the best wine. So the, the movie Bottle Shock, uh, the, uh, 2008, is, tells us the story of Chateau uh, Montelena. So from that moment on, we began to see changes in, in, in the valley, and those changes can be traced uh, to the, to the uh, Napa Valley, um, to, to the rise of the, of the Napa Valley uh, Mexican, Mexican population. So for example, uh, in the 1970s, the Latino population was at 3.6%. Uh, by 1980, four years after Paris, the Latino population was at 8.2%. It increased to 15% by 1990. And by 2000, after investment and revitalization projects, the Latino population was at 26.8%. And today, it's closer to 40%. So what I, what I argue is that the rise of the, of the, of the wine industry um, and the rise of, of, of the, the Paris wine tasting contest matches the increase in, 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 in the Latinx population in Napa. And of course, there's other factors, including you know, Mexico's economic crisis that we saw in the 70s and 80s. So all these things are synchronized to increase the number of workers uh, and the, numbers of, of the number of Mexicans and Latinos that, that we have, that we have uh, in, 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 in the valley. 
um, in, in the work, I also, in, in, in this, uh, within this context, I also talk about the erasure of other presences uh, in, in the Napa Valley, including the Chinese presence. So this is just a, a, the Sam Key Laundry uh, building or the Pfeiffer building, which is at the corner of Napa, of uh, Clinton Street and Main Street in Napa. And we, can, we know that that used to be a Chinese laundromat because of the plaque uh, that's, that's, that's there uh, on the right. So one of the arguments that I make is that with each, um, with each, the, the way that historians have told the story of Napa, you know, they neatly begin with a, with a indigenous presence and then the Californios and then the Chinese, uh, and then everybody leaves the, 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 the historical narrative, right? So it's sort of like, uh, it, it has this, this way of, of compartmentalizing history. Uh, and instead we know of, of, of uh, we know of, of Mexicans, or we know of people of color uh, in the Napa Valley by some plaques that we see and that if you don't pay attention, you can miss them. This is a, a plaque that talks about where Chinatown is located, and this plaque is on, on the First Street Bridge uh, in between South School and Main Street. We also have statues of Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez uh, that, that are up above a, a restaurant in, in downtown Napa that highlighting the, the, the pre this, this historical moment. And we also have this mural that's called um, Tuesday Morning uh, 1720 that aims to highlight uh, the indigenous presence in Napa. But again, one of the arguments that I make is that all of these uh, statues and plaques compartmentalize, compartmentalize, um, uh, compartmentalize history. So let me um, let me tell you um, a little bit about. Uh, so so that's those are one of the. I mean I, I I'm skipping some stuff, but like for a lack of time. But um, but let me tell you a little bit about Carolina Bayo, who's who's central and important uh, to uh, to to my work. Um, so while doing research in the Napa Valley, I came, at, I came across Carolina Bayo. Every single book I read, every magazine, every booster's account told the same narrative. She was a wife of Charles Krug, and that's Charles Krug. Um, <clears throat> so Charles Krug, uh, and that's all, that's all we know, right? That's all the, 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 the narratives uh, about her say. Charles Krug, on the other hand, has a much richer narrative uh, and archive and holds a more prominent presence in Napa's historiography. In fact, he has been canonized in the narrative and is credited as a winemaker for, who first made wine for consumption and production in the late 1860s. Krug is an immigrant from Trenchelberg uh, near Prussia who arrived in Philadelphia in 1847. By 1852, he became a US citizen and was living in San Francisco, editing the first German newspaper in California. By 1858, he moved to Sonoma, uh, to the Sonoma Valley, and began planting vineyards. At the age of 35, he married 19-year-old Carolina Bayo on December 26, 1860. The marriage certificate described her as being uh, a resident of the Napa Valley, uh, California as her place of birth, and her color as white. Uh, similarly, Krug uh, is described as being a resident of the Napa Valley, as being born in Germany, and also as being white. Their ages are not included in the marriage certificate, but I know that she was 19 and he was 35 based on other documents that I've, that I've looked at. He received 540 acres of land as part of a dowry in his marriage to Carolina Bale, and out of those 540 acres of land, Krug used 20 acres to build his winery, uh, the Charles Krug Winery, then called the Charles Krug Cellar. Um, Krug is Krug because of his wife's land. Uh, the material presence remains present via the winery that bears his name, and his legacy continues to be celebrated by the Mandavi family. So just to give you an example, so the Mandavi family bought the Charles Krug Winery in, in, um, in uh, 1843, uh, and at that point, the Charles Krug Winery was under the ownership of James K. Moffat, um, whose uh, undergrad library is named after him, and, uh, and I'm not quite sure what connection there was between Moffat and the Krugs. Um, I, I haven't uh, found that relationship. So uh, on February, on March 3rd, 2012, um, the Charles Cook uh, Winery celebrated Charles Cook's birthday, and the announcement, as you can see up there, says as follows, throwing a birthday party for everybody's uh, favorite Prussian revolutionary, activist, entrepreneur, and founder of Napa's first winery, Charles Cook. The celebration in the carriage house will include a number of special guests, including our good friend and medium, and spirit medium, Leanne Thomas, who will attempt to channel Krug uh, to send him our uh, sincere birthday wishes and possibly ask him a few questions. How often do you get to wish someone a, uh, a happy 187th birthday? The evening will be uh, a lot of fun and commence at 6 p.m. with appetizers, followed by a three-course dinner paired with exquisite Charles Krug wines. Um, so this is what you know. One of the arguments that I that I that I make is that uh, he continues to be celebrated at the expense of, of silencing. Um, of silencing. I don't know what else to say. I have three minutes left. Um, um, let me let me tell you. Um, let me tell you a little bit about um, Carolina. Um, she's not part of a generation of Californianas, right? A lot of the, the 
a lot of scholars have done research on California, and she's a product of, 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 the, of an interracial marriage between her mother and, and her father. Um, so she's actually a part of the, one of those relationships that I think are missed in, historic, in historical accounts where the, the focus tends to be on the mother and not uh, on the impact of the next generation. Um, for example, the work of Genaro Padilla, Rosalba Sanchez, uh, Rosemary Bibi, among others, present a thorough account of California life. And it seems to me, though, that the second generation, the products of those marriages, has not been explored, and here is where Catalina Bale fits. Um, so what I've been able to find about her is that she had three sisters, uh, Is uh, Isadora, Ana, and Juana, Maria, and two brothers, Eduardo and Mariano. The Bale children were all born between 19, 1839 and 1949, as their father died. Uh, that year when um, he caught a fever while joining the gold rush. Carolina, along with her uh, siblings, were all born before the Mexican-American War, which means they were very young children uh, when California jo joined the Union in 1850. Her, her mother, Maria Ignacia Soberanes, became a widow on the eve of, state of statehood. And as Miroslava Chavez Garcia found, Californianas with pro property needed to become really familiar with U.S. laws to be able to keep the land. Maria Ignacia Soberanes ended up being married three times. Uh, she lost her first husband, uh, Edward Turner Bale. Her second husband, Edward Peabody, also passed away. And then she was married uh, a third time because she needed, um, that's, that's the way that relationships worked at that time in terms of needing somebody to protect, uh, to protect, her, uh, to protect her land. Um, she, as a young child, Carolina Bale learned um, English in schools and quickly became accustomed to navigating new political, social, legal, racial, and gender system that surely affected her material side of the family. It was clear that Carolina and her siblings were sent to boarding schools where they were discouraged to speak and write in Spanish. Letters to their mother written by Mariano, Carolina's younger brother, frequently find him apologizing for his poor written Spanish. Um, there were, in, in several letters that I was able to read about, uh, between uh, Carolina's mother and her mother's uh, relatives, they constant, constantly asked about Carolina's health. And I, I couldn't find, figure out what was wrong with her. Um, but, you know, I, I, I went to the Charles Coop, on my first visit to the Charles Coop winery, I asked a member of the tasting room personnel if they had an archive, because sometimes wineries have archives of their own. Um, and they told me that they didn't have any archives, but that Carolina Bale had, had gone mad. She was sent to the Cook House, meaning the Napa State Hospital. Um, I figured I could, uh, that if I had access to her records, I could find why she was placed in the state hospital. Uh, but unfortunately, the Napa State uh, Hospital burned in the early 1900s, along with several of the records. Uh, in a book titled Prohibition in the Napa Valley, Lynn Weber, and that's not an academic book either, she writes the following, Caroline, and her name is also really important because sometimes they name her Carolina Bale, other times Caroline Krug, and those things matter, right? That, that how we name people. Um, and, you know, Lynn Weber says, you know, Caroline uh, was besieged with bouts of depression and was finally committed to the state-run mental hospital in Napa where she died. Uh, it's possible that alcohol was a root of Caroline Krug's suffering. Her father had a serious and notorious alcohol habit. Genetics are now known to play a part in the development of alcoholism. So that's what Lynn, Lynn Weber says. Uh, the, her obituary says that her health broke down immediately after the adverse decision of the civil suit of the Puget uh, Sound Labor uh, Lumber Company versus Charles and Carolina Krug, uh, held in Napa a few weeks ago. So, so they were sued, um, and apparently after that, then she she became really really um, ill and died. Uh, but she also lost a child uh, in, 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 in 1865. She lost a child, and, and my hunch, and maybe I'm speculating here, my hunch is that maybe that's that's. That's what she. That's why she was depressed. And, and an area that I'm interested in, is, in exploring is, or what were the common illnesses at that time for women, and how perhaps, uh, and what made uh, women go mad, uh, and what, and why were they placed in 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 in, in, uh, in mental in mental institutions? So let me let me um, let me just uh, wrap it up and tell you uh, why why um, a little bit about uh, the, the the questions that I'm that I'm compelled to ask. So one of them is, you know, how do we deal with a fragmented record? There's very little that we know about her. Um, how do we as scholars elevate the presence of those silence by the archive? For helpful frameworks, I turn to the pioneering work, such as that of historians Eula Taylor, who in citing Cheryl Harris reminds us, reminds us that often women of color, in particular black women, were subjects to be overlooked, misread, misinterpreted, and ultimately misappropriated. For Taylor, in her path-breaking study of Amy Jacques Garvey, she came to understand that for black women, it was difficult to be known to be known in via public records. Essentially, one can speculate about Jacques' life only by contextualizing and drawing conclusions from the few tidbits of information she did share. 
Similarly, for my study, uh, going by the public rec record alone will not do. We can then speculate about Carolina's life, uh, perhaps by looking at the lives of other women, descendants of Californios during the second half of the 19th century, and by the tidbit of information we do find. So here, the work of uh, Maria Raquel Casas, Miroslava Chavez, Vicky Ruiz, uh, and Rosario Sanchez on Californianas is critical, as well as the work of Dina Gonzalez on Nuevo Mexicanas. But why does her absence matter? Why does Carolina matter so much? <clears throat> Uh, in one of the chapters of Silencing the Past, Power in the Production of History, Michel Rothschild examines what he calls the three uh, faces of San Jose, the man, uh, and two buildings. Only two San Jose's, he says, the buildings are recognized by historians. San Jose, the man, is silenced in Haitian history as he alters the narrative of the Haitian revol revolutions, revolution since his story forces us to reread what Michel Rothschild calls a war within a war that was the Haitian revolution. Certainly, I'm not comparing Carolina Bale to San Jose, the man, but there is something to borrow in terms of methods and approach from Michel Rolf Trio. Charles Krug has two faces, the man during the second half of the 19th century and the Krug that was purchased by the Mandavis in 1843. Um, uh, there is a third figure missing uh, from the two Charles Krug and that of Carolina Bale. However, it is not only her historical silencing that concerns me, but how the creation of an old world European identity at the expense of silencing of old California families of Napa that point to the continuous silencing of present day, of Mexicans in present day Napa has shaped and produced the image of the Napa Valley. Carolina Bale stands in the way of the old world roots in the Napa Valley planted by Krug, the man, and reinforced by the Mandavi family. Those roots are possible because of her and because of her legacy and her family. Recognizing those roots will then force us to understand or to unveil other silenced accounts, indigenous land before the arrival of the Spanish mission, California history in the making of the Napa Valley, and that of Chinese labor in the late 1800s. So this research uh, that, I, that I have yet to complete, this is research that I have yet to complete and will allow me to produce a relational approach to Napa. As Avery Gordon says, uh, to study, and I quote, to study social life, one must confront the ghostly aspect of it. This confrontation requires or produces a fundamental change in the way we know and make knowledge in our mode of production. And this is where I want to conclude. Thank you.